Greetings internet once again, this is Eurosoul and it's pretty much the middle of the night here. I've been awake all day, had a long day here, it's been pretty hot and uh, so forgive me if I'm a little bit disheveled and tired but I'm going to make a, re um, a response here to Kath Kanaki from Steemit. Uh, he uh, made a video in response to an interview that I did with Danny Shine a few days ago where we were talking about capitalism and uh, Danny brought up Jeff Berwick and um, other other things which um, Kafkanaki felt that he wanted to respond to by kind of clarifying that um, Danny's perspective on anarcho-capitalism and perhaps mine um, you know maybe it's missing some important things that he uh, wanted to put across so um, he put this video together and uh, it's about half an hour of him talking and explaining a variety of different ideas so what I've done is just chopped up a few scenes and I'm gonna play them through for you here and I'm gonna give my responses and uh, I'm going to do my best uh, not to have my video last about 90 minutes because I already recorded one which was 90 minutes and obviously that's way too long. So I'm going to get right into it and uh, start off with a clip from Kafkanaki. I feel like there's such a misconception uh, which goes around about voluntarists and anarcho-capitalists and um, I think that misconception should really be addressed. And I was reminded of this misconception uh, this morning when I watched a video, an interview uh, done by uh, URA Soul. That's URA hyphen Soul, S O U L, here on Steemit. Um, he's a witness here as well. Um, we've had our disagreements in the past, but there's actually a lot we disagree on. Um, okay, so just a quick introduction there, and just wanted to play that clip just to point out that Kafkanaki made the point that he made a little slip there where he said, uh, there's actually a lot that we disagree on. What he meant to say was there's actually a lot that we do agree on. Um, I've been talking to him in the chat uh, here and there, and it's clear that we do really do agree about um, probably some of the most absolutely important core aspects of um, how to have balance and a successful society, and, and we share a lot of thinking. Uh, it, what I want to make clear in this video is some of the points where we do differ from, as far as I can gather, and I also want to make clear that I have in the past thought pretty much exactly the same as him. Um, when I was younger, I was a very, um, I was just capitalist basically. You know, in my thinking, I was very much behind the idea that if I do work, then I should be rewarded for it, and the same for everyone else. And um, basically, you know, trade and, and exchange and money and these things, they might not be completely perfect, but they are fundamentally basically a good thing, and you know, they motivate people and so on. I've since over the course of about 10 or 15 years of having worked for corporations, worked in you know various different groups, different projects, different industries, seen things behind the scenes that a lot of people haven't seen. I mean, basically, I've done a huge amount of research in so many different directions, it's, it's difficult to even list them all. But um, after having done all of that, I now think quite differently. Um, I still think the same as Kafka Anarchy on certain important things, the core principles of certain aspects. Um, but I think I have insights to give which would will at least explain to him why I think differently. So that's what I'm intending to do here. So uh, I'll just play on the next clip from him now and we'll start to get into it, into the details. Uh, because I think th these are some valid points that were raised in the interview about there's valid reasons why people might perceive anarcho-capitalists as um, just basically greedy, uh, self-serving bastards. Um, now, there's a shit ton of stuff I do not agree with at Danny Shine um, I, about in the video. And um, to be fair, at You Are a Soul also is just interviewing him, so uh, it doesn't mean he agrees with everything either. Um, there's stuff that at Danny Shine said that literally made me cringe um, just because I feel it's a misunderstanding of the fundamental reason uh, for propertarianism for for ground norms grun norms based on individual self-ownership people think this is about greed actually it's the opposite it's about fairness okay so um i've had a lot of conversations with people who call themselves anarcho capitalists and uh, different kinds of anarchy type subgroups on different forums and i'm pretty sure i've gone through most of the um, basic shared perspectives that anarcho capitalists seem to have and um, usually I find I agree with some of them, usually I don't. Um, so I think there is a, there's a disconnect here happening between Kafkanaki's thinking of what Danny's saying and why I think he's, uh, understand that he's saying. Um, you know, Danny's not here to speak for himself, but, um, I, th I think, um, 
when when Danny's talking about his problem with capitalism and and saying that basically if he was saying I, I can't remember exactly word for word what he said now but um, bringing up the idea of fairness um, or at least I'll comment up from my perspective when we talk about fairness in terms of capitalism and and Kafkaniki saying basically real capitalism is fair because it means that everyone gets to basically um, reap the rewards of their effort and you know so that's ideal. Um, I think where me and Danny are coming from is that in reality that's never what happens. Just like in, with communism, it, it's never really equal and fair and reality is that you have one or two or a small group of people taking everything from everyone else. Basically capitalism seems to always work out the same. Um, and I don't really think we have a proven example where that hasn't happened. And it's, it's alright to say, well the state is the cause of that and the free market, you know, isn't the cause of that. Um, that's fine, but where's the evidence and proof that that's true? I mean, I'm not aware of any. I'm not aware of any culture where there has been, let's say, an ideal, idealized free market um, anarchy type situation where the resources didn't eventually accumulate all in the hands of a few people. Um, I don't think there is a system of governance or um, economic system that can prevent that basically if, if you want a system that doesn't have control in it which is a good thing and from my perspective then um, you're going to have to deal with the fact that the programming and conditioning in humanity as it is as out of balance and heartless as it is basically in many cases it just leads to a situation where people are exploited by other people and I don't think capitalism can solve that and I don't think it has solved that and I don't think it ever will solve that um, and I don't think communism can solve that, and I don't really think that 99% of systems that people come up with can solve that. Bearing in mind, I am actually a trained um, system architect, say, um, system engineer, basically. Uh, so I studied systems at university, and that's what I'm employed to do most of the time, um, outside of Steemit and things. So I have spent a lot of time thinking about systems, and designing systems, and looking at problems with systems and applying all kinds of interesting logic to them and, and so on. So I'm not just saying this from a sort of idealistic perspective or um, a vague sense. I'm saying it actually from a position of having thought about this in, in, in a lot of detail. Um, so that's really the point, first point I want to make in a sense, although I've made many other points, but um, my main key point is that I noticed that when anarcho-capitalists talk about anarcho-capitalism they get very passionate and they they talk as if it's proven that anarcho-capitalism is the best possible form of, of system of, of living kind of thing and and I just wanted to point out that I've never seen it proven um, and, and it's the same for most systems that are alternatives to what we have I've never really seen any of them properly tested uh, so and it's not that I haven't looked I just I just don't you know don't know of any examples so from my perspective you know it's fine to have passion about a system but at least let's agree or, or get to the bottom of the idea or the question as to whether or not they've actually ever been properly tested and proven. Um, I do know of like Michael Tallinger's group, the Ubuntu movement from South Africa, uh, who, who are operating on a voluntarist system and they do use a degree of capitalism but even he, you know, he will openly say he wants the end of money and he wants the end of the whole system pretty much. I, I'm pretty sure he wants the end of capitalism. Uh, I'm not 100% sure on that, I haven't read his book, but I'm pretty sure I've heard him say he wants the end of money. Uh, but they know that you can't just jump from our system where we're at right now in the mainstream to having a system without money um, in an easy jump because uh, the rest of the world is is already using that whole system and they're not about to you know just accommodate you in a very easy way. We have to have a way of transitioning and I think that's why they've, they've operated or opted for having their system of uh, living where the people come together and form a community to work together voluntarily, completely voluntar voluntarily. Uh, and however, when they make an abundance of, of food and so on, they will then sell that. And the idea is they become so efficient because they're working together instead of working for bosses um, that they produce a lot more than they would do otherwise. And um, whatever's left over, they can sell. So um, I think there's more options available than simply state-controlled capitalism or anarcho-capitalism or anarcho-communism. Um, I'm a bit of a fan of, let's say, just pure anarchism uh, with no um, sub-flavour to it, which simply just means we're free. That's how I look at it. Um, 
everything we do is voluntary, and as soon as I overpower you or someone overpowers me, it's not anarchy anymore. Someone has actually attempted to breach the peace, and uh, you know they're not acting in an anarchic way. So um, I'm going to get more into that as we go on, but I'll play the next clip now. And to get into this video, I just want to start with some anecdotes. Because this whole idea of voluntarists and ANCAPs being greedy... In my life experience, I found it to be the exact fucking opposite, man. You know, voluntarists are the first people who will lend you a buck, who will light your cigarette, who will help you out if you're in a jam, in my experience. It tends to be the communist type, yeah, peace, love, help everyone, everything should be free, man, type of person that never has any money or resources with which to help anyone. And in my experience seems to be the most self-serving type of personality. Okay, so we're getting into the core of this really now. So the point here about people who oppose capitalism not having resources is not really a surprising outcome. It's not a surprising thing to me on the basis that we live in a system where the capitalists basically have controlled everything, or more or less everything. Um, so... Basically, everything is owned by someone, or more or less. And so, if you opt out, if you want to opt out of that system, where are you going to go? What are you going to do? You're screwed. Basically, you're you're basically trapped, um, and you're probably going to end up homeless. It's that simple. Unless you find a community of people, or you're a very strong person that can really make waves and change things in a major way. Um, I don't think it's very fair to say um, people who oppose capitalism, if that's who he was talking about, are people who want to help everyone, the so-called hippies. Um, I don't think it's fair to say that they're not good or, or open-hearted people because they don't have the resources to help people when the resources they need to get, the system says, they have to they have to go against what they think is right in order to get the resources. So they've had basically been forced to make a decision, either go against what they want to do or don't have any resources. Um, or they've got to find another option, which, you know, historically tends to end with violence, and that's not what so-called hippies are going to do. So, basically, they're a bit screwed. I think if you look at... Um, a really good example would be uh, the Rainbow Family. Um, Rainbow Family of Light, I think is their full name. Uh, check out a documentary about them. Um, uh, you can find that on Vimeo. The name's not coming to me. It's on my website, eureka.org, as well. That's really an inspiring thing to see. That That's basically a bunch of people who I would say um, are the closest you're going to find to an organized bunch of hippies uh, today and they travel from all around the world and come and meet up every year or most years uh, in a natural environment they they create a city basically a small city to look after themselves at the end of it they clean it all up so there's not even a single piece of garbage left behind um, and they are there to try and help everyone basically they are very much of that mindset um, and they do have some resources, and but but basically they are having a hard time as well because as, over everything I just said, basically you know the park rangers, whoever it is, they'll come along, and I've, you can see videos of them actually shooting the people with pepper balls and pepper spray and all this stuff, and they're doing nothing. They shot children as well. Obviously that's the state. That's not capitalism doing that. But my point is that it's very hard if you want to buck the system to actually survive at all, let alone succeed in in having resources and. Um, so again, I, it's a bit of a um, straw man, I would say, to um, to try and claim that capitalists are better than non-capitalists and to even link in and associate communists with hippies as if they're the same thing, when they really aren't in any way the same thing. I mean, communism and hippies, when I picture the two groups together, maybe today they're a bit more similar. I don't know any communists nowadays. Uh, well, I've never met many communists, but uh, my point is that... Um, the historic vision of communism from Lenin and Marx and so on and on forwards to history really, in my mind, has almost nothing to do with being a hippie. Um, the, the marketing, PR, public relations version of communism, whereby it was meant to be equality for the workers and for everyone to sort of have, have an equal share, um, isn't exactly really the same as being a hippie. hippie as I understand it, hippies were uh, very much about change, revolution, free love, and they were basing it on something, as I understand it, which is a bit more esoteric than communism. It was Communism was very much more about um, industry, I think, and, and sort of what I would call the kind of um, closed-minded approach to life. Um, and hippies were 
maybe a bit too open-minded, you could say, but they were looking to expand consciousness and their heart and to try and find a way to live in tune with nature and so on. It's very different to communism. So uh, anyway, on to the next clip. Um, money and trade are beautiful things which preserve and and enrich and actually are part and parcel of human dignity. Okay, so I just put this clip in here just really because of the thing that he said at the end there where, where, where Gavkanaki is saying that money is part and parcel of human dignity. Now, the way I hear that, that basically kind of means you can't have human dignity without money. And I would totally disagree with that. I think that, um, in fact, money is quite degrading in a lot of ways. Um, it places value arbitrarily on things which, uh, numerically, which to me are sacred, things that cannot have and uh, it, it's almost sickening to try and put a value on them. You know, like my friend just had a, a puppy. He just got received a puppy. Um, people buy puppies. You know, it's like you've got a, a mother dog giving birth and someone comes along and says, ah, oh, here's $50. That's that's what that puppy's worth. I'll give you that. This is a living being. You know, that's literally slavery from my perspective. I'm a vegan. Basically, I know that all beings are of the same source. Um, they're people, animals are people with different shaped bodies and different temperaments and alignments and so on, different spirits, but we're all ultimately one in a very real sense. And, and I think that to claim that you can't have dignity without money is, is a huge denial of, of what dignity is and what money is. And um, I think that you know, most people can understand that money and freedom are the opposite of each other. You know, if something's free, it doesn't cost anything. If something you know, if you go into a shop or, or someone gives you something for free, it's free. It doesn't have a charge. It doesn't have a cost. So money and free are opposites. So when we try and say, or if anyone tries to say that money is somehow the fuel of freedom that makes freedom, to me, that's just completely backwards. Um, I understand the logic that says that money empowers people to have some kind of trade and uh, open certain doorways within um, a, a system of, of society that is based on exchange and so on. Um, however, I would say that there are other systems and other approaches which you need to zoom out to, to appreciate them a bit and, and radically change your thinking on certain things, um, which which basically show you that really money is um, is quite a poor replacement for something natural, which is far deeper and more powerful. Um, money is basically a way to have an agreement with other people. So you don't actually need money to have agreement with people. What you need is an understanding and a bonding. And I think this is what Danny Shine was pointing to when he was talking about how we're all a family. Um, and we, you know, from his perspective, we should all help each other. Um, and I think Afghaniki, you know, appreciates that. And he, he made the point that um, people in reality, in real life, we're not, although we are technically a big family, we don't treat each other like a big family. And there are lots of people who are disconnected and they're not going to help each other. And that's completely true. Um, However, money doesn't solve that either. Money, in fact, money introduces its own problems because we have a situation then when people will work for money to do things, first of all, they wouldn't do anyway. They wouldn't do without needing to get the money, A. B, they will do things for people who they wouldn't normally do things for. So far from it being um, something which uh, gets around the problem of the disconnection and the heartlessness in society, it actually, in a way, perpetuates it because, for example... Um, let's say uh, no one's looking out, out for me, I've got nothing and I've got skills so I'm going to go and do a job to get some money to get the things I need because everything's already owned by other people from before I was born which you know is in no way a meritocracy, is no, in no way something that dignifies me, it's something that traps me from birth basically but um, that's property, that's the downside to property. Um, but if I need to go and you know get that money then I may end up doing work for people that I would never normally voluntarily um, desire to work for those people, um, and I may, or I may just simply never find out enough about them to know whether or not I really want to work with them. I'm just, you know, I need the money, so I'm going to do the work, uh, and that's the situation we have right now, where, where you know, some of the most brilliant scientific minds of our of the last few decades and um, even centuries possibly, but certainly decades, have, have basically gone and worked for the, some of the military contractors, the biggest government mass murdering, you know, entities on the planet, because that's where most of the money is for them, and they want the money. So my point is money does corrupt, 
uh, and it does help us lose sight of some of the important things in life. And um, it, dignity is a bit of a broader concept than Kafkanaki is pointing to here. Dignity is uh, something which, for me, it's a soul thing. It's like it operates within my soul. It's how I feel. It's what's in my heart. It's much more than just, oh, I can look after myself because I've got money and um, you know I don't have to beg and steal from anyone. Um, if we lived in a balanced society, I wouldn't have to beg and steal from anyone anyway. Uh, we would be so in tune with nature that we'd have an abundance regardless of money or of government or of any of these things. Some of the biggest problems we have right now is that basically we're totally psychologically and spiritually disconnected from the earth and from the universe and from nature. And we, we're, we're clueless. Most people are completely clueless about how to live in harmony with the earth. Uh, some of the last cultures that really did know about living in harmony with the earth were basically raped and pillaged and murdered by European continent uh, invaders, you know, in North America and the, those tribes who were really, you know, when when the people, when the Europeans arrived in America, the land was pristine and, and almost, you know, pure. Sure, they weren't 100% perfect, they weren't 100% peaceful all the time, but they were doing a heck of a lot better than, than the Europeans were and, and we are today. Um, and, you know, if you look at what happened when those people in, invaded the land, they, they basically exchanged, in their minds, and in the history books that they wrote, they exchanged basically an entire continent for a few, kind of, more or less, a few boatloads of beads and rugs and things. Um, and, and from my perspective, I'm fairly sure that a lot of those tribes people basically just found the whole thing laughable. They kind of thought, well, you can't own land. Why would we even trade these things? We can't trade the land for, the, for you for these bees or whatever. I don't think they even really understood what was going on. But anyway, the point is that that's if you can't kind of see that the idea of property rights is in huge conflict with the Aboriginal perspective on things in a lot of cases, um, at least in the way that it's played out in the kind of structured way that white-skinned people are brought to the world. Let's put it like that. Um, then I think there's something a bit wrong in your in your um, there's something too closed in, in your perspective of what's going on, and it might be a heavy bias. And, that, and that's the thing that I have, that's the major issue I have often when I'm talking with proponents of anarcho-capitalism um, and many other subjects as well, but people are so rigid in their thoughts and their beliefs, and they're so convinced that their beliefs are completely correct, and they're so against the alternative, and so almost militant against the alternative, that they're... They're, they're stuck, basically. They're not willing to listen to, to... They don't even understand that another alternative can exist or that there might be blind spots in their perspective. And, and That's why I try to sort of point people towards and I've done a lot of work in finding these things in myself and as a computer programmer, as anybody who's a good computer programmer will know, you can't have blind spots in your logic because the computer's going to tell you in a blink of an eye, hey, you're wrong, you're not going home tonight, you've got to get this fixed. And, and we don't have that as humans. We're, we're allowed to have sort of lazy logic in the way that we think um, and we're allowed to shout about it all day long and say that it's right and you know sometimes we're not going to get challenged on that but as a computer programmer you can't do that and as a systems analyst I can't do that and designer um, and if I'm designing an important system for someone you know maybe people are going to die if I don't actually make sure I'm ultra careful about whether my logic is lazy or not so I'm not trying to say hey I'm appealing, appealing to authority I know how to think and you don't I'm not saying anything like that um, I'm just saying that, from my perspective, just trying to explain that um, I can see blind spots in the logic here. So anyway, move on to the next clip. That we are self-owners and that we need to have property in order to live peacefully on this earth, right? This shirt is mine. If anyone can just come and rip it off of me at any time, um, we're going to have violent conflict in the world. And that's just a fucking shirt. Um, we're talking about way more important stuff, way more important resources um, at Danny Shine brought up and lots of people brought up, we're all one family. Why, you know, you don't charge your family for things. I think this is a fundamental misunderstanding of what money and trade is all about because even in the family unit, there is, there is a kind of trade there, even if it's not with monetary notes or whatever. And it's all based on individual self ownership, right? Uh, if you help your brother with a really hard move, of course, you're not, you might not demand money from him. Um, but your brother is going to understand that you used your body and your effort and your time to help him. And there's a kind of, it's not a, it's not a, you know, if you're a decent person, you know that you're kind of obliged to help the brother then next time he's in, in trouble. 
Um, in family, that works fine. Uh, the sad reality is not everyone outside of our immediate circle is going to treat us like family and um, there's going to be conflict. And the way to minimize this potential violent conflict is through a system of grunt norms that are universalizable. The only system of grunt norms that is truly universalizable and that is truly equal. And here's where we get to giving. Here's where I'm getting to giving equal opportunity to everyone is uh, propertarianism. And I, I won't even say ism, individual self-ownership. The, basically, uh, the golden rule or the reverse golden rule, whatever, you know... Um, Whatever you don't want done to you, don't do to other people, right? Okay, so there's a few points here. First of all, I want to just make the point that, for me, self-ownership is a bit of an oxymoron, if that's the right word. Um, I am the self. I am. I simply am. Ownership doesn't need to come into it. I don't want anyone to own me. No one does own me. But I also don't need to own myself either. It's, I just am. So um, that's a philosophical point that does have relevance. Um... However, we, I do understand the concept of self-ownership, meaning basically that you get to decide what's right for you, and that's fine, I agree with that. Um, so when we talk about equality and property rights, basically I think that's what um, propertarianism possibly is. I'm not an expert in that idea at all. Um, in fact, it's probably the first time I've heard it. But um, if we're talking about kind of the capitalist model let's say and and you know the acceptance of property rights and so on uh and and that being bringing equality um i don't really see that that works because for a lot of different reasons first of all we've inherited a legacy system in the shape of the world as it is right now whereby lots of scumbags have done lots of bad things and they've basically taken property from everyone else and called it their own and i'm not saying again that that's the fault of capitalism but the point is that that's where we're at. So if we're going to move to a better society that still uses enforcement of property rights and so on, then how are we going to deal with that problem? The only way you can do it is to reset everything and basically cancel everyone's rights and start again. Cancel everyone's property and cancel and start again. And then how do we how do we then decide who has what property from from that situation? If no one's got any money, no one's got any property, and we start again. I mean, you know, maybe that's possible, but. Um, yeah, I mean, no one's even... I haven't really heard anyone present a, a method of doing that in a functional way, and I don't think Afghaniki has, and I don't even think that's really what he's suggesting. Um, so I don't really see that property brings equality. I, I see that property, in a pure sense, in practicality, in practical terms, bearing in mind we're dealing with billions of people who are, lots of them, imbalanced and who aren't looking out for the best interests of other people, um, and are basically living in fear and trying to control things and hoarding and so on. Um, with that in mind, the result we see time after time after time in every basically every country is is not equality. It, you know, in an idealised, perfect laboratory situation, you could call perhaps some aspects of it equality, but that's not what happens. So, <laughs> um, I think that's where Danny and I are coming from when when we ha- we we sort of say that we're against capitalism. It, it, it's for reasons of that, of that, uh, relating to that, and and maybe it's fair to say it's not capitalism that's the complete cause of the problems, but capitalism doesn't solve the problems, and that's that's my complaint primarily with it. Um, so when I was younger and I was more into capitalism, and I was out trying to you know make a name for myself and and gain resources and build a life, to me capitalism seemed like a good thing because basically in a way it was an excuse for me to focus on myself and just solve my own problems and say well. You know, if someone else has got problems, that's their problem because they haven't, you know, worked hard enough. Whatever. I mean, I didn't really say that, but that's, in a way, that it make, makes it convenient. It's a convenient tool, um, philosophically, to allow yourself to focus on your own progress. And you feel like, well, I felt kind of like I was, you know, fighting the world in a way because I wasn't being given hardly anything. Um, and so it makes you, you know, you say it makes yourself reliant. But the flip side of that is when I look back on it, I had to work far too hard, you know, I burnt myself out before I was 25, um, and, you know, no one should be living like that, and I never even got a house, not once have I had my own house in my whole life, and I'm 39 now, right, I mean, maybe I could have done it through doing other, making other choices, but my point is, I worked very, very hard, uh, all day long, you know, 12 hour days sometimes, without even a doubt at all, at certain points of my life in a week, um, and, you know, where did it get me, and so... 
uh, it was only really once I let go of those ideas and learned to relax and learned to basically look for a more spiritual approach to life which focuses more on balance and, and actually tuning into metaphysical aspects to reality that aren't even attempted to be accommodated by economic theories usually, as far as I'm aware. Um, that was when I started to actually have success and enjoy life and, you know, uh, <laughs> all I can really say is that the concepts of capitalism are, sometimes they're convenient for me but sometimes they're not, and sometimes I think they cause me more problems than they, they solve. Uh, so I'm looking for a better alternative, and I, I'm pretty sure I, I understand a large a part of what that alternative is. Um, and, you know, maybe it's my obligation and duty to put that across to people, and I do, do post from time to time on that, and I'll do my best to uh, kind of cover that in the video as we carry on. I do agree that... The systems of parasitic crony capitalism, which are empowered and protected and preserved and perpetuated by the state, are the problem. Okay, so I put this clip in here basically because I just wanted to make the point that crony capitalism and the corrupt governments and so on, yeah, they are one, basically one and the same thing, but, but that's the point, isn't it? They are... the. I find it a little bit confusing sometimes when people complain that the the the, um, the problems with government come from socialists, for example. Um, not everyone even agrees on what a socialist is, but to me, when I look at the people running governments, maybe it's just because I'm in Britain, but uh, and America as well. When I look at the people who are running the governments, they're to me they're massive capitalists. That you know, they're some of the richest people around. They own massive amounts of stuff, you know, businesses, um, all kinds of things, and. They're capitalists. So when we look at the state and say, oh, look, it's the bad state doing all this bad stuff. Right, but it's a bunch of capitalists who got together to set that up. Yeah, and you can say, well, they're not anarcho-capitalists. And yeah, they're not. But the point is, they are enacting the principles of capitalism. And so that's why I would say, you know, if anything's going to work, that is something along the lines of voluntarism and anarchism. Anarcho-capitalism is down the list for me, basically. I mean, a purer form of anarchy and, and voluntarism is... Um, from my perspective, far more likely to succeed. The most charitable people I've seen in my life are voluntarists. My fucking Jesus, it's true. I mean, uh, my buddy at Nick Skorsky, he's a farmer, a permaculture, permaculturalist uh, organic farmer here in Japan in Nagano. And he said to me once, you know, I, in my life, I've, it's been the first person to ever help me out with a dollar or to light my cigarette has always been someone that's like a voluntarist. It's the ones that go on and on and blibber blabber blubber about helping everyone and oh we've got to help and everything should be free um, that are the last people. Oh, will you take a, will you please take an immigrant into your house? No, no, I can't help. Would you please donate to this charity? Sorry, man, I can't. Um, hey, do you have a few bucks, bro? I can borrow. It's always them because they don't have any resources. Um, and of course, part of that is you can blame the state. But in another sense, it's not. It's this mindset that life should provide my needs for me and I don't need to work. Even absent all statist uh, templates, all institutions of the state, we still got to climb up that hill and hunt that beast. Or, uh, Danny, you're a vegan. You still got to climb up and pull the apple off the tree and that's work. So what I mentioned about esoteric um, spiritual kind of um, truth and, and research that I've done, part of what I've learned is what I understand to be kind of the original imprint for planet Earth, and, and I don't want to use the word correct, but basically the intended way of living on Earth, uh, which is free and easy, and you do exactly what you want to do. It feels good when you do it, and you're aligned and you're at peace. And it's simple, it's relatively simple. Uh, and if we were collectively living in that way, I don't mean as a collective, I mean if together we agreed to, to aim to live in that way rather than in an industrialised nightmare of hard, alleged hard work and quote-unquote success and competition, if we actually basically just work together to have fun and enjoy ourselves um, and key, 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 work with the planet and learn how the planet works naturally um, instead of relying on corporations to give us bogus science about how their products are going to save the world and stave off hunger with genetic engineering and crappy synthetic fertilizers that destroy the soil and keeps hooked to their products like a heroin addict. Um, if we actually learn, much like you, um, Kav Kanaki was mentioning there about his friend who's a permaculturalist, if we learn to use permaculture and other 
um, understandings to actually work with the land in that way. Um, I don't really see that we particularly need money at all, personally. Um, and I don't, you know, and, and I think the idea of property rights is up for debate as well, to a certain extent. I don't have a problem with people owning property. I own property and, you know, it's helpful. I need it. I'm not complaining about that. I'm just saying that there's room for change as well. There's room for variation. Uh, and, and, um, I think that, uh, I already mentioned about, um, resources being kind of, um, more readily available to those people that conform to the prevailing system than it will be to people who challenge it. So um, I think, again, go back and watch the Rainbow Family of Light documentary and you'll see a different angle on this. And it's certainly not just people that have got money that kind. And the whole reason that ANCAPs are ANCAPs, why I'm an ANCAP is because I see that the system is unfair and the, the best way to make it equal for everyone, every last fucking individual, is to have, to level the playing field and give equal opportunity to everyone, which the libertarian natural law of property based on I own me, you own you, that's what it does. So I fundamentally disagree with this. I think I've already probably said this, but if you've got a system which allows one person to acquire a control over significant tracts of land and resources that other people can't access, um, then that's not equality. It's just it can't be, you know. And, and if you've got a system where um, it's fine to say, like I said, in an ideal world where people only like acquire more resources through legitimate work and so on, um, that, that they should have those greater resources. But in reality. I mean, most people, like 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 Kafkaniki was saying, most people are quote unquote good in the in the sense that they they want to sort of look out for each themselves and each other, and they're going to do what's needed to succeed and so on and try and live in balance, or at least you know if they thought about it, they would do probably. Um, but in that case, then you know you shouldn't be having a situation where people can acquire dramatically more resources than other people because what, how can one person's life be so much more, worth so much more than other people's really um, but so then that sort of brings the question well if we're going to have equality I, I, it's just a paradox it's, it's, it's a contradiction in terms to me not even a paradox it, to say that um, equality and um, commerce and ownership go hand in hand when the whole purpose of commerce, in a sense, is to create imbalance so that the people who, quote unquote, are worth more, get more. And so, I mean, we can talk about this. It would be much easier to talk about this in person, and I'm sure we would be able to jump straight through a whole bunch of points quickly. And maybe we should do an interview and maybe Danny can join us as well. And that'd be great. And I, you know, I think it'd be a lot of fun. Um, but, um, yeah, it's just uh, there's significant point problems for me with, with what's being said there. As, as we are individuals, we are individuated. And we have various different, unique, unpredictable, unlimited wants and needs and resources are scarce. We do need to understand that in order to survive, we're going to have to have an equal opportunity um, for everyone. And that can't be through force. Uh, because that violates someone's free will. Um, you know, if you say, oh, you have more than me, bad, I'm going to punch you. That's not it either. But the beauty of the free market is, see, absent the state, if some asshole starts hoarding everything, the people around are going to see this guy is hoarding everything, causing everyone to starve. Are we really going to do business with him? Right. So, again, this is the same sort of point. If... If somebody does have so much more than everyone else, it doesn't really come down to whether or not you want to do business with them. The actual control of the resources is itself a form of coercion and force. It's a form of violence, basically, and this is what Danny was saying. If, if somebody does find a way to hoard a whole bunch of stuff, then your life is potentially threatened, or at the very least, you're more likely to be pressured to do things you don't want to do just to survive. And that's where we're at right now. But nothing about anarcho-capitalism prevents that from happening. And, and it sounds like what, what you're basically saying, Kafkaniki, is, well, in the absence of a government, what's going to happen in that situation is, first of all, people aren't going to trade with that person. And then maybe they're going to go and kick off, and I'm pretty sure in the next clip he says that they're, they're going to um, maybe kick off and, you know, go and get the pitchforks. And, 
and take back the land and so on. But but that's a huge contradiction, isn't it? It's, it's basically saying you know everyone has the right to work and gain things, but but not if it gets not if they're too good at it. If they're really really good at it and they're so much better than everyone else, then everyone else has the right to take it back. So it's kind of like there's this whole there's always this swing from one side towards the other of um, kind of maybe something you could call socialism to capitalism and flipping back between the two. And that's that's why the the system that we have, the political system, which has completely been engineered by psychopaths, as far as I can see, um, who have designed it, if you listen to Carol Quigley's work, the Ivy League historian who, who exposed this in the 1960s um, very well, um, if you listen to what he's saying, the whole system of left-right paradigm is completely phony and completely designed to make you think that there's a choice and that um, things are always sort of moving in a direction that's evolu- evolving and changing, whereas in reality the whole system is controlled by the same people behind the scene, um, and it's always going the way that they want it to go. Um, so if you bear that in mind, then you can kind of see how um, the idea of... Um, well, I, I, I'm really tired now, I'm actually starting to sort of fade out of it and lose my, my thinking a little bit, but... Um, yeah, I think uh, we should probably come back to this again, and I have already written posts on this, so I'm just going to skip ahead here before I start to you start seeing Zeds coming out of my eyes. Um, but uh, yeah, if you if you want to carry on talking about this stuff, then let me know, and, and we'll go into it when I'm more awake. The market rewards humanity and humane behavior. It does not, absent a government, reward destructive behavior on a large scale or on a whole or as a norm. Right now it does because the state bails out banks when they fuck people over and make people poor. It protects police that murder people. It does all of this. And Right, so I've just reminded myself of what I was trying to say. Um, yeah, so this argument I've heard many times from, from ANCAPs, basically blaming everything on, on the government and saying that basically people are good and um, it's only the government that, that basically results in bad people being rewarded. Um, the problem is that I've met a lot of people in my life who have got nothing to do with the government, who basically are what you might call bad people. And, you know, they actively do things to hurt people. And they actively hurt, and they would do it on a grand scale. They're, you know, the kind of people that would, I mean, some of the evilest things governments have done, they would be behind. And they would vote for it and they would organise it. But the point is, they're not doing that as part of the government, not even in the government, but they agree with it. And so my point is, they would actually do these things with or without a government. And I've met quite a lot of them. I mean, maybe they're the older, mostly the older generation, to be, to be fair, but um, very close-minded, you know, close-hearted people. But maybe it's just from where, where I was brought up in England, in that part of the world, but I saw that quite a lot. And from my perspective, maybe that's why I'm a bit more cynical or real, realistic, from my perspective. Um, we need to heal. That's why I'm focusing my work on healing and balancing and evolving, because I know that no system can make up for a lack of heart and compassion. And and it is possible to cultivate compassion. It is po- possible to, to cultivate and evolve intelligence of the heart and wisdom and these things, which basically when we have these things, the rest of the problems sort of melt away because we don't need to fret over which system works better or who's going to write the rules for this and that, because we're actually conscious beings. And that's the answer to the problems. Um, using our intuition to guide us to find balance in every situation. Um, and it means that I don't have to think uh, for, for anyone else. No one has to think for me. It's the idea. It's how you have free will on a planet well, with complex life forms and complex desires and many different individuated beings. Um, we have to be in touch with our feelings, and the feelings are going to guide our thoughts towards knowing what's balanced and to make sure we're not overpowering anyone. Um, I don't think it's the free market that does that. Um, I think the free market ultimately is ne- not necessarily good or bad. It's just it's just a, um, a process, and so just like a knife can be used to kill or to to heal, so can let's say the free market. And um, this is kind of my point. I think it's a little bit naive to say that the big the only problem we have is government and that the free market solves all the problems. I, I actually I'm 99% sure that isn't true, um, and I think. Uh, having a free trade situation is better than having a heavily regulated and controlled government trading type situation. Uh, I agree with that, but I think we can do a lot better. 
The market rewards humanity and humane behavior. The beautiful thing about anarcho-capitalism is under the law of property, Danny, he could do that and be free to be uh, that kind of character and you would not be forced to associate him or live under any of his mandates or dictates as to how you should live. You could form a, a voluntary community, uh, a commune if you'd like, where everyone shares everything. And voluntarism allows for that. Sadly, a lot of communist groups don't allow for voluntarism. Even when I've said, hey, what if I just start my trade commune over here where we want to trade and trade value for value? Um, they would say, no, because nothing's property. Property's not yours. All the while, they're talking with the mouth that only they have control of through their brain. They're exercising individual self-ownership, their own property, and they don't know it. And uh, they, they can't connect. I, I always like to ask these people, can I come over to your house and sleep on the couch for three months and eat all your food for nothing? Oh, no, but uh, there's no such thing as property, man. That's just personal property. It's it's. All right, so that's the last clip I'm going to play here. So he was actually referring to Jeff Berwick, um, as I recall, um, at the start of that clip. And so, yeah, this idea it really sort of touches on everything I've already said. And um, the idea that, you, you, I mean, I'm not a communist. I don't, I don't advocate for communism, but... First of all, there's this sort of fallacy that there's only the op option between communism and capitalism, which I've, I mean, I'm dispelling that. I don't agree with that at all. But, um, but if you, if we're talking, in, rather than talking about communists, if we're talking about people who, um, don't accept or don't want to validate property in that way and who, um, kind of want everything to be free, um, then again, I don't think we, we've, just like we haven't seen anarcho-capitalism really tested properly on a, in a big way to prove that it works, we also haven't really been able to see an alternative hippie reality, let's say, or even a communist reality, because other forces always come in and try and control and dominate. Um, and so, yeah, again, um, I mean, what I, the point I do want to make, just finally, to reiterate about the problem I have with the capitalism side of things, in, in the example, the flip side to what, what Kafkanaki just said then, is that um, capitalism basically doesn't allow you to have all these different versions of ways of living side by side either, because where do property rights begin and stop? If, if one group says, hey, we want to we wanna have our situation where everyone shares and, and we don't really, we're not that bothered about property rights, that they still have to have some property in order to do that. So they are then therefore forced to exist in a system of property rights and boundaries and enforcement and trade and commerce. And outside of their community, if the world in at large takes a turn in such a way that basically they can't exist without um, that, that community, that voluntary type um, sharing type community, can't exist without um, trading for some reason because the resources have been quote unquote owned by other people beyond their sort of commune or whatever you want to call it. Basically, they're stuck, aren't they? They they have to then conform to go along with not sharing with other people. They have to then do a certain amount of um, use of money, just like the Ubuntu group has been forced to do, even though the designer of it really didn't exactly want to do that. Um, so. Basically, that's the problem. It, from my perspective, claiming as soon as one person claims property rights, that basically then has a knock-on effect on everyone else, which forces them to also declare property rights, or they're under threat. That person who, who owns property and says, well, we can all trade and, and own property, it, at least in the way English law works, and probably in a lot of other places, they can just say, oh, well, exactly what the Europeans did to the, to the Native Americans. They can say, well, look at all this land. No one owns it. Or, you know, here, here's this land that these people kind of own, but they don't really understand property rights. Well, we can just take it or we can make up some phony agreement and say, hey, you know, uh, take some beads. And yeah, now we own it. Great. The point is that if there's no, in, in the face of no competition for ownership, you can basically just claim the stuff and take it um, in that system. Um, and... Uh, that's just how it works. I mean, that's how property works, at least in the system that we have, which is regulated and enforced using rules and regulations. If you remove the state, then how do you enforce property rules? Um, who is it that says, I own this and you own that? I mean, unless you've got it all documented in, a, in some sort of system which we can refer to and, and agree upon, maybe a blockchain, something like that. But the point is, just because a blockchain says something, doesn't mean to say that it's actually going to play out like that in real life. Someone still has to have the ability to act to enforce those boundaries or they're worthless. 
um, and and it's just it just becomes a situation of, of conflict. That's all I can really say about it. And I think that's again coming back to the heart, and that's why why um, Danny was sort of in his way his own way pointing to the heart and saying, you know, we're, we're gonna we've been fighting and competing over land and boundaries for far too long. And um, when when he quoted uh, that line about stop this fuckery, we're all one family. You can take that in numerous different ways, and my version of that is to basically say, you know, look, the way we've been living with all this ownership and co- competition and, and and all this stuff and fighting and struggle is is only it feeds itself basically, and um, there must be a better way to do this, and and I don't really see how we can do that, how we can find that better way whilst we're placing numerical value on things, and you know, basically saying, I can own this if I've got enough imaginary money of some kind. Um, meanwhile, someone who hasn't participated in the system that we want to use doesn't have the imaginary tokens that we think they should have in order to own something. Therefore, they don't own anything. So I think it's a bit hypocritical to say that it's communists that are trying to force their system on everyone else when capitalism actually does exactly the same thing. Um, and that's that's why I'm that's why in my soul I feel a bit sick when I think about capitalism now, and, I, and especially when I hear people saying that um, when they're when they're pointing the finger at communists and saying, "Look at these bad communists! Look at what they're doing! They want to take my stuff and overpower everyone else." Capitalism does the same stuff. It does exactly the same thing. It's just that it does it in a way that you can put a label on it and say, "Oh, it's fairer." Um, so to me, communism, capitalism, I, I can easily argue that they're two sides of the same coin. They're both dysfunctional, and I don't really like either of them very much, but. If I had to choose one or the other, I mean, I'd probably choose capitalism, but that maybe is just because that's the one I know better. Um, and, and I do happen to know that communism, as it was sold to the public, was never actually how it was acted out. So maybe there is a way to have the original, uh, you know, promoted version of communism that never actually happened. Maybe that could happen, and maybe that I might even like that about capitalism. I've got no idea. I'm not, I've never seen it. I don't know that it's ever happened, but... I'm not a communist. I don't really like to call myself a capitalist. I don't like any isms at all. Um, I just like to be free and I like to feel good and I like to be creative and I like to solve problems and I like to help people. Um, and I like to just enjoy life. And, and, uh, and that's my, my agenda rather than having some sort of system I'm trying to force on anyone else. I actually like systemlessness after having been a system architect and worked with systems and thought all this through so much. I actually like systemlessness which is something much closer to an anarchy. It's, it's the ending of the tyranny of the mind on the self, the ending of the tyranny of the mind on, on our own will. Um, and that's part and parcel of not owning yourself. Um, because basically, when you say you own yourself, it's your mind declaring that it owns your will. That's what you're doing. Um, and you might not think of it quite like that, but that is what you're doing. Um, and from my perspective, that's dysfunctional to, for the mind to, to actually decide such a thing means that it's disconnected from the will in the first place. Um, so from my perspective, I think it's much healthier to go through the heart and to connect your mind to your will so that we op- internally operate as one being instead of these fragmented parts that are sort of a bit like a, a driver driving a car or riding a horse. Instead of that, we're just one being that is willed um, and that creates. And it's, it might sound a little bit simplistic, but it is simple and that's good. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with simple. Um, so anyway, I, I talk about these subjects a lot. I, I've even travelled to, to, to places around the world to talk about this, and I'm, I'm writing a book about it. I, I've made many posts about it. It's kind of complicated, and to do it justice requires over a thousand pages of text and a lot of dedication and hard work on cleaning up our own mental processes and ending judgments and denials and removing the lenses that sort of cloud our perception a bit. So I don't expect anyone at all to fully agree with me on what I'm saying or to even understand what I'm saying, to be honest. But um, I do like saying it, and if you have any questions, then I'm happy to answer them, and it would be really great, uh, Kafkaniki, if we could talk face-to-face uh, over the web, and maybe with Danny, and um, I'm sure we have some fun, and, uh, you know, we'll probably be good friends. So, anyway, I, I'm, I've talked enough now, and I need to go to bed, so uh, peace to you, peace to everyone watching, and uh, thanks for watching, and uh, I'll see you in the comments. Cheers.